Hi everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Can you hear me okay? I don't know if this is perfect. Okay. Um, so my name is Shalan, and uh, my daughter Ryan, who's 19 months old, suffers from AADC deficiency. We live in a suburb just outside of Toronto, Canada. While trying to prepare for this speech, I found it very challenging to properly articulate the immense emotions associated with our story, as simple words and photos cannot even begin to explain our struggle. But I'm hoping that what I've put together will do. On October 14, 2014, my husband and I welcomed our second child, a seemingly healthy, beautiful baby girl. Our family was complete, and we could not have been happier. Ryan Lila Rodriguez Pena was born via planned C-section. She spent two days in the hospital with me. She weighed six pounds, 14 ounces. Her APGAR was a wonderful nine, and we were both given a clean bill of health. Feeding was a bit difficult because she seemed to be very sleepy, but I was the only one who was worried. During the first months of life, Ryan was sleeping almost 23 and a half hours a day. We were told that it was no problem as long as she was eating, which she was, so I tried to put my worries aside and trust the experts. Other than her extreme sleepiness, Ryan exhibited no other concerning behaviors. She so showed typical movements such as hand to mouth and was settling into our family with ease. She was happy when she was awake and receptive to our interactions. Milestones started to be met. Both her first smile and laugh happened as they should, albeit with her eyes closed, but we weren't too concerned about that. I continued to relentlessly Google sleepy newborn or two month old sleeping too much, but nothing came up, so it bought me some time to be almost worry free. We truly had no idea what we had on our hands, nor did we know just how much our precious little girl would have to fight every single day in the months to come. Ryan caught a cold when she was two and a half months old. She started to struggle to breathe and could not eat as she could not breathe through her nose. She was diagnosed with RSV and bronchiolitis, but nasal congestion was the most problematic, leaving her unable to eat. I attempted to concern the doctors about her sleepiness, but again, it was just chalked up to being a sleepy newborn. I remember a friend of mine came to visit us during our six day hospital stay and asked me if I was worried. And I told her that I was okay because we knew what was wrong and we knew that it would go away. How different things were about to become. <coughs> we tried to make the best of it. We spent New Year's 2015 sipping ginger ale in our local peds unit not having a clue that we were bringing in what was to be the worst year of our life. Ryan was released from hospital and eating well. I remained concerned about her excessive sleepiness and now at almost three months of age, I was concerned about her lack of strength and movement when she was awake. She was not yet hypotonic or at least not notably. However, she showed no effort in trying to hold her head up. We knew something was different about our little angel but we had never expected the dreadful world of dismay that we were about to be thrown into. At four months old, Ryan's doctor finally solidified my concerns by stating a simple sentence that would forever turn our world upside down. I think she needs to see a neurologist. These eight words have played over and over in my mind, symbolizing the start of our unforeseen journey that would forever change our lives so drastically. And so started the questions without answers, the overwhelming, fearful, horrible emotions that consumed every minute of every day, leaving me incapable to, of thinking about anything other than Ryan and, dis, and my desperate attempts to help her. Our world turned upside down. Fear and panic ruled our lives and made every new day feel as painful as the last. We were referred to a neurologist and I called the office daily However, we were told that they could not tell us when our appointment would be due to the long waiting lists. How people are expected to just sit there and wait in situations like this is beyond me. It was not an option for us. I drove her downtown Toronto to the hospital for sick children and I cried my way through the emergency room staff until she was given an appointment to see a neuromuscular specialist. However, that too came with a waiting period. I could not just sit and wait. 
We started countless attempts to help Ryan. We started physiotherapy, both government and private. We also started chiropractic care, alternative treatments, and we connected with religious supports. We finally saw a specialist who was fairly confident that she had a neuromuscular disease that he believed was non-degenerative. And to, the test to confirm this would take four months to provide results, four dreadful months. We were told of 160 conditions that she was being tested for. There was treatment for one. Hope was definitely not being handed out, and I was in pieces. We started ABM, conductive education, osteo and naturopath, praying like never before, and the list goes on and on and on. We started to learn new concepts crucial to child development that just happened so naturally for our son, such as midline which Ryan was not able to meet with her head, her hands, or her feet. The more she was awake, it became increasingly obvious that she was hypotonic and very developmentally delayed. Ryan started spending most of her awake time crying. It quickly got to the point that if she wasn't sleeping, Ryan was crying almost constantly. This threw me into panic as all of thinking about all of her missed opportunities to learn about the world around her. If she spent all of her time either sleeping or crying, along with her substantial physical delays, my every attempt to help her felt so overwhelmingly defeated. I became very depressed and isolated myself from friends and family. The almost impossible task of keeping Ryan soothed took over my life and stole nearly every opportunity of happiness from our whole family. Due to Ryan's distress, my then two-year-old became scared of, scared of many situations. He developed anxiety, panicking whenever she would start to cry. The strain on our marriage seemed to grow each day, and as much as one would like to just pick up the pieces and move on, it proved impossible to do so when the picture of the puzzle is no longer what it was before. Nevertheless, we continued to push on and advocate for our baby girl. Ryan underwent seven months of invasive testing while I underwent the painful experience of hearing doctors say like things like, she probably has an underdeveloped brain and that's just the way she is, or she may be the first in the world with whatever she has, or we may not be able to identify what this is with the testing available today, none of which are words a mother wants to hear about her young baby. Despite the underlining hopelessness, a voice in inside me told me that none of these opinions were true, and I pushed for an MRI, which yielded normal results, and that was the only relief I had to hang on to. No answer was not good enough. I spent hours upon hours Googling Ryan's symptoms or words that the doctors had used that weren't clear to me or I wasn't familiar with, and our house quickly became filled with scrap paper like you see here. I found the one on the right a few months ago, and if you look closely, kind of in the middle to the page, I was shocked to see that I actually wrote down AADC deficiency months before we were actually diagnosed. I assume I heard the doctor mutter something about neurotransmitter disease, and I just went with it. But in any case, my countless jot notes remained insignificant as more testing pursued. Microarray, countless blood work, metabolic and genetic workup, nerve conduction studies, neuromuscular panel, 24-hour heart monitor, EKG, muscle biopsy, two spinal taps because the first one was not collected properly, and then finally, diagnosis at last, AADC deficiency. Hearing the words treatment and gene therapy were like music to my ears. A workable diagnosis is what we were praying for. We finally were at the finish line, or so we thought. We happily started a hopeful regime of medication as soon as we could. It was amazing to see the eyes of those who had silently given up on Ryan light up when we said words like medication and explained how gene therapy could potentially help her. But to our dismay, medication has not provided the type of changes we anticipated. We are really grateful, truly grateful, for the small yet mainly autonomic improvements that medication has provided but Ryan remains extremely comfortable and fearful. 
From about four months of age to 18 months of age, Ryan spent 90% of her awake time crying. She would have to be held and soothed constantly. Some of the things that made her cry were, if you sat down while holding her, we needed to hold her and be moving constantly for her to stop crying. Being put down at all, even just for a minute. Waking up. People, nobody at all could go near her. Wind when we were outside. New places, hearing running water, people laughing or any unexpected notable noise, lying on her back, being on a change table, public restrooms, flushing toilets, sounds of plastic or paper bags, dressing, undressing her, taking her socks and shoes off, sunlight, bathing, getting her face wiped, being in a stroller, new environments. I mean, guys, the list just honestly doesn't end. And aside from the heartache of not being able to help my baby in such distress, the constant crying was taking its toll on me, and I was no longer able to cope. I started having to take antidepressants just to survive. Ryan was present from all of our important family events, but missed out on virtually everything due to her crying. I felt like giving up every single day. In the last two months, Ryan has improved quite a bit, and she now spends about 60% of her awake time in tears, unable to tell us what's wrong. Due to this, we have been unable to attend family functions, birthday parties, restaurants, new places, or community events, even grocery shopping with Ryan needs to be avoided. I have always felt a constant pressure to expose her to as much as possible just for her to gain new experiences and have an opportunity to learn. But with her constant crying, it proved both pointless and extremely frustrating for everybody involved. In addition to her, her irritability, Ryan struggles daily with severe and painful constipation as well as acid reflux. The GI issues that she deals with cause her a lot of discomfort and she is taking medication to help with that, although we're not sure if it's doing anything. Regular vomiting due to food or medication or crying too much or sometimes even during her sleep for what seems to be no reason at all. Many times when I'm driving, I need to pull over as she starts vomiting from crying too much. And even if we're on the highway, I have to pull over and I quickly grab her and turn her upside down so she doesn't choke. Nasal congestion. This is most problematic when she's sick, but it completely stops her from being able to drink and we have to resort to syringe feeding. Her inability to do anything for herself. Everybody here is pretty well versed with the effects of AADC and Ryan is considered to be on the severe side. She cannot reach for toys or use her body in any purposeful way. We're still working really hard on head control at 19 months. <laughs> uh, no, I'm okay. Yeah, thank you. Poor feeding and poor weight gain. Compromised vision. It's suspected that Ryan has CVI, also known as cortical vision impairment but it's very hard to diagnose. Fearfulness and anxiety rules her world. And of course, the popular ocular gyrate crisis. Ryan's OGCs occur every three to four days and last up to eight hours long. It is obvious how straining it is on her little body. The older she gets, the more dystonic her OGCs become forcing her legs and feet into unnatural, pain, unnatural painful postures. AADC has taken its toll on our baby girl, and like the true thief that it is, it has already robbed her of virtually everything she was to explore, experience, and engage with during her first year and a half of life. Many of my close friends also had babies around the time that I had Ryan, and I still cannot see them. The pain of watching other babies and toddlers so easily enjoy, love, and learn about life, while my little girl cannot even hold up her head is too much for me to bear. While they are running around on the playground, we are waiting to be fitted for a wheelchair. As they are enjoying the independence of self-feeding, Ryan continues to eat purees that I so diligently pack with extra calories because the ever-present threat of needing a G-tube is always in my mind. 
We no longer live in the same world as those who complain about things such as their child's teeth and pain or diaper rash. Our world is much more devastating. AADC has taken everything magical and wonderful away from Ryan and has left me feeling like the empty shadow of whoever I used to be. As her mother, my job is to protect her and the pain that comes with the inability to do so, all while having a front row seat to watch AADC take away her quality light of life is beyond words. We continue to pray and we continue to give Ryan an army of daily medications and work hard towards therapy goals that we may never meet. We pray, our family prays, our church prays, even people that have never met Ryan pray for Ryan. And I know God is with us and God is for us, but the daily fight against something that has already claimed so much victory over Ryan's little life is exhausting. Being able to connect with other parents has been very helpful and although most are hundreds, if not thousands of miles away, it has made this lonely place a bit more tolerable. I also want to take a moment to thank Lisa Flint for all that she has done and how hard she has fought for children that she has never even met. She is a true example of how love, hard work, and perseverance can really change the lives of others. Now, if we look at Ryan with numbers, in 2015, Ryan attended 226 related health appoint health related appointments. She had six emergency room visits, four hospital stays, and two surgeries. So far in 2016, Ryan has had 57 health related appointments, 36 OGCs. She's vomited 22 times. She's had three emergency room visits and has been admitted to the hospital twice, once for pneumonia. She takes nine different medications multiple times per day, a total of 21 doses administered in a 24 hour period. That brings us to 2,835 doses so far for 2016 alone. And all of these numbers are riding on one hope. And that one hope is gene therapy. I have thought about gene therapy multiple times every single day since Ryan was diagnosed. No matter how horrible things are, I try to hang on to that one hope that is right in front of us. That one hope that could help improve my daughter's quality of life. That one hope that is alive in this room right now. The one hope that by the grace of God, along with the works of the wonderful doctors that are in this room and around the world, that exists to help my baby girl. I dream of a future where Ryan will have a miraculous story to share with the world, where by one day I will return to a similar podium. However, the next time Ryan will be standing by my side to share the message of how gene therapy and you wonderful people have changed her life. Thank you for listening to our story.